So, Windows 10 is finally reaching end of life, and for a lot of people, that means one of two things. Either they can't upgrade to Windows 11 because their hardware doesn't meet Microsoft's arbitrary TPM and CPU requirements, or many won't upgrade because, frankly, Windows 11 feels like malware with a start menu. Let's talk about that. We're diving into what you can do after Windows 10 dies, why Linux is the easiest way to breathe new life into your old machines, and why it's time to take back control from Microsoft's nonsense, including their old Embrace extension and extinguish tactics that are creeping back into play with the Xbox ecosystem, cloud gaming, and their push to dominate every corner of the tech world under the guise of convenience. And before we get into it, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel, and follow me on all of my other socials below to help the algorithms and see more content just like this. Windows 11 should have been a refinement of Windows 10. It was supposed to be the last Windows we will ever install. Lies! You sit on a throne of lies. But instead, Microsoft doubled down on data collection, forced updates, and let's be honest, straight up ads inside your operating system. It's all about getting more data to profit off of you than actually care about you. That's why Microsoft really doesn't care about piracy anymore. You really think you are getting one over on Microsoft because you got rid of a watermark? You've probably seen this. Recommended ads in the start menu, suggested apps in File Explorer, edge pop-ups begging you not to use Chrome, and of course, the infamous Microsoft Recall, which literally screenshots everything you do and stores it for AI recall. Yeah, that's not creepy at all. Your clingy ex-girlfriend or boyfriend is probably way less creepy, especially when you compare it to that one ex I had. Anyway, combine that with telemetry you can't fully disable, cloud tied accounts just to log in, and random Bing junk shoved into the search bar, and suddenly Windows feels less like your computer and more like Microsoft's computer that they rent to you. So yeah. I get it. People are frustrated. You shouldn't have to fight your own OS to maintain privacy, performance, and basic usability. But here's the thing, you don't have to. Please, for the love of God, don't do the ignorant thing where you dig in your heels and say, I'm just going to use Windows 10 forever. It's end of life, meaning it's no longer getting security updates. That's how you end up being patient zero in the next ransomware outbreak. Did we learn nothing from WannaCry? Running old unpatched operating systems isn't just insecure, it's reckless. Eventually drivers, browsers, software updates, and even hardware support will break down. You'll lose functionality piece by piece until one day something critical just stops working. So don't cling to Windows 10 out of stubbornness or even nostalgia. You have better options now. What I've been doing for years, and I recommend you try, is installing Linux or even FreeBSD on older machines. You'd be amazed at how much faster a slow laptop suddenly feels when you ditch Windows. That old Core i5 system from 2012, it suddenly feels brand new. Your fan isn't screaming, your disk isn't thrashing at 100% from background updates, and your system just works. Linux doesn't nag you about TPMs or unsupported hardware, it just boots. Now. I've tested a ton of distributions over the years, but here's what I usually recommend, especially if you're new. Pop OS, made by System76, it's super clean, gaming friendly, and just works out of the box. It's personally what I like to use for the past few years. Ubuntu, the classic, very beginner friendly, and widely supported by software vendors. There's plenty of forks of Ubuntu as well. Pop OS is actually one of those forks. There's also Kubuntu, which uses KDE for the desktop environment, and Subuntu using XFCE for the desktop environment, just to name a couple of forks. There's also Fedora, a great balance of cutting edge features and stability, backed by Red Hat, and yes, there's Linux Mint. I'll be honest, I personally can't shake that incident years ago where their ISO downloads were compromised and malware slipped in, but the project has recovered since, and it's still a solid option for those who want a more traditional Windows-like desktop. If you want something maybe a little bit more adventurous, there's Endeavor OS, Zorin OS, Nobara, or Bazite, which is a newer Fedora-based distro that's amazing for gaming and home theater setups. And this is just a very small list. There are hundreds of distributions out there, and one that probably fits you. And please, despite what some people may tell you, don't just jump in straight into Arch Linux. Arch users are like the CrossFit vegans of the Linux world. They'll tell you about it. You don't even have to ask. Every five minutes. No hate. They know they're the butt of the joke, and honestly, most of them lean into it. But for those of us who actually touch grass or have a social life, there are better and more practical starting points. Now, I know what a lot of people do at first they try to make Linux look like Windows, and that's fine. It's a natural comfort zone, I get it. But here's what might surprise you. Once you start using Linux daily, you realize just how 
bad the user interface and user experience on Windows actually is. Seriously, after years of using Linux personally while using Windows daily for work, I find myself stumbling through Windows now. The menus feel slower, the layout is inconsistent, then customization is practically non-existent. Yes, with Linux you have ultimate freedom to make it however and whatever you want. But I actually urge you to experiment with different desktop environments and distributions instead of just copying Windows. To name a few, you can try GNOME, KDE Plasma, Cinnamon, Mate, and a few others. It might feel awkward or different at first, but give it a week, and suddenly you'll wonder why Windows ever felt normal. For me, Linux desktops just feel faster, cleaner, and far more customizable. It's like rediscovering what personal computing was meant to be. And no, you don't need to use the terminal nearly as much as people say you do. We have stores and stuff where you can click and install apps. And before we keep going, quick shout out to today's sponsor, Proton. If you're looking to take your privacy seriously in a post Windows world, Proton's suite of tools is the way to go. They've built an entire ecosystem focused on privacy and security, including Proton Mail, Proton VPN, Proton Drive, and Proton Pass, all working together under one account. They're based in Switzerland, outside of the US and EU data sharing jurisdictions. And everything they do is open source and end-to-end -end encrypted. I personally use Proton for years and I trust them enough to make them a regular sponsor here on the channel. You can check them out using my link below in the description to support the channel and protect your privacy. All right, let's get back to it. When people first switch, what amazes them most isn't the look, it's the speed. Linux doesn't actually get slower over time like Windows does, often it actually can get faster. People are patching for performance very often. Linux doesn't waste time for unnecessary telemetry or background optimizations. You open a browser, it opens. You launch Steam, it launches. Even with Proton and Lutris, gaming has become easier than ever. I've been daily driving Pop! OS on my main workstation for years, editing videos, running OBS, compiling code, and gaming, and it's been rock solid. Meanwhile, Windows updates still find new ways to reboot at the worst possible times. 11 minutes and 44 seconds. Fuck Microsoft! Now, let's talk about gaming, because I know that's what a lot of you care about, and I'm going to have a whole separate video going into this topic. But if you've seen me live stream, you already know. There's really no limitation to what you can play on Linux these days. Even big AAA titles run great, with the only exceptions being those that require the unethical kernel-level anti-cheat, or CLAC. In fact, many developers make their anti-cheats more Linux-friendly. And honestly, even if I were still using Windows, I wouldn't install games that use those. There's literally tens of thousands of other games out there you can enjoy. Tell devs to F off with these unethical clack approaches. It doesn't even stop cheaters as well as you think it does, especially with new tactics and techniques like DMA cheats. You will never convince me that kernel level anti-cheat is acceptable. I have a whole video on why it's dumb and dangerous. I'll leave a card for that and put it down in the description. In fact, since making that video that I mentioned, my stance is only hardened. I don't even think security software should have kernel level access anymore. That thought actually came after a fantastic talk by Dr. Lewis DeWeaver at GERCON, a cybersecurity conference I attended recently. I'll have a whole separate video about that hopefully soon. It really opened my eyes to how much unnecessary risk kernel level code creates, even when the intentions are good. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So yeah, the fact that Linux gaming has reached the point where I can play nearly everything without sacrificing my system's integrity, that's a win in my book. Now, if you want to get a little more hardcore, FreeBSD is always an option. It's not as beginner friendly, but it's incredibly stable, lightweight, and great for things like firewall servers or network appliances. PFSense itself is actually built on FreeBSD, and I've used it for years to power my home lab firewall setup. In fact, I like the networking stack better on FreeBSD than I do on Linux. So yeah, Windows 10 may be dead, but your old hardware doesn't have to be. Whether it's Pop! OS, Ubuntu, Fedora, or even FreeBSD, you've got options that respect your privacy, perform better, and give you back control over your own computer. Microsoft might have given up on your machine, but Linux hasn't. If you found this helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it with someone still clinging to Windows 10. And if you want to see how I set up my Linux in my home lab for servers, firewalls, and gaming rigs, I've got plenty of videos for you to watch and plenty more to come. Thanks for watching, and as always, happy hacking.